It is great to be joined today by Andy Yen, who's the co-founder of the end to end encrypted email service Proton Mail, which was founded in 2014. I know a lot of people in our audience, Andy, have over the last six to 12 months started using Proton Mail accounts. I know I made one uh, a couple of months ago and, and do use it now. So let's maybe just to start with what what do we mean when we say encrypted email? And I guess importantly, what happens if your email is not encrypted? What are the implications? What's the alternative to encrypted email? Well, the main idea behind encrypted email is to build an email service uh, where actually only you and the recipient have the ability to read your emails. <laughs> So that means nobody else, not the internet provider, um, and not even us, have the ability to read your emails. Uh, this is good for a couple reasons. Uh, first is because we don't have access to your emails, uh, we can never breach your privacy. Uh, and also, if ProtonMail were to somehow become breached or hacked, uh, in fact, your emails are still secure. Uh, so it's sort of the you know uh, next step forward in email security. So when we talk about you know our audience has been following NSA surveillance. Uh, hacks and breaches that have taken place uh, on all sorts of different platforms. If you let's first talk about the possibility of back doors that that can be built into different communication systems, whether it's email or social media platforms, by virtue of how Proton Mail is set up, is it even possible that there could be a so-called backdoor set up? Well, if you were to compare it to, say, a service like, you know, uh, Gmail, uh, the NSA actually doesn't need a backdoor to get access to that, right? Uh, they simply ask uh, Google to, you know, give them that information. Uh, so, you know, in fact, it's very easy to, you know, get access um, if they wanted to to Gmail account data. Uh, you know, with ProtonMail, it's a bit different uh, because it's encrypted in a way that we cannot decrypt. Uh, so, in fact, it's not possible for any third party to come to us and say, you know. Give us information on this user because we actually cannot do that. Uh, so this is why you know it's a it's a bit of a stronger guarantee of having your privacy and security uh, respected. Uh, you know there are ways, of course, to uh, backdoor encryption. Um, you know you can be you know uh, if we were somehow forced to do that. Uh, you know is it possible for us to somehow break Proton's encryption? Uh, you know that of course is possible, right? Because um, there's no such thing that is 100% secure. Uh, every system. Uh, can be breached in one way or another. Uh, but in ProtonMail's case, it's, let's say, you know, significantly harder. Uh, and for that jurisdiction being in Switzerland, uh, you know, it's actually not legal uh, to, you know, do any sort of encryption backdoors uh, without user consent. If police were investigating a crime and the suspects, it was learned, communicated via ProtonMail, is there anything that authorities could do technologically to obtain those communications and then also legally in order to obtain those communications? Well, from a tech, from a tech perspective, um, all the encryption is happening on, on client devices. Uh, so, you know, because of that, there's actually no way to really, you know, force us to decrypt it because we don't have the ability to do that, right? So, technically, um, it's not really possible. Um, now, if the authorities were to, you know, identify the suspect, get a hold of the suspect, um, then they can, of course, compel the suspect to enter their password uh, and get it and get data that way. Uh, and that's actually the, uh, you know, I would say the correct way because, you know, typically mass surveillance assumes everybody is guilty. Uh, but the proper way to do this is to really go after the targeted cases that you want to go after. Um, and that's by, you know, um, not going after service providers, uh, but instead going after the criminals themselves. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, using ProtonMail doesn't mean that you can conduct, you know, criminal activity with impunity. Uh, if you get caught, the police can still look at your device and, you know, ask you to give them the password. Yeah, there's this. I want to talk about that idea of committing crimes with impunity uh, that that you mentioned. You know, in in the cryptocurrency space, there was this assumption made by some early in the Bitcoin days that Bitcoin was being used significantly for illegal transactions, whether it's drug deals or even worse things. And then when the Silk Road got shut down it barely had any impact on the sort of amount of Bitcoin uh, uh, m money that was flowing through Bitcoin. And at the time, Bitcoin was much smaller. And that sort of started making people think, oh, wait a second. One of the main sort of purveyors of these Ill illegal uh, purchases and sales was shut down and it barely had any impact on on Bitcoin usage. We were wrong about the propensity for using using it for criminal activity. How do you approach the idea that 
since if you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't really be worried anyway about this stuff that proton mail is disproportionately used for criminal activity. Mm. Well, I think there's the headlines and there's the reality, right? And there's often a very, very big difference between that. So in the Bitcoin case, uh, you know, it was interesting new technology. Uh, so the headlines of, you know, Bitcoin is primarily being used for illegal, tra illegal transactions um, was in many ways a sexy headline, uh, but that doesn't really re reflect well with the you know, actual um, reality, right? And it's the same with Proton Mail. Uh, you know, we have statistics about the number of police requests that we get um, versus the overall user base. Uh, and in fact, you know, um, Yahoo, Google, and other big tech companies also release these figures. Uh, in fact, you know, our rate of criminal use on our platform is not, you know, from us, it's not actually any different from, say, Google, Yahoo, these other providers. Uh, so if you look at the pure data and the pure facts, there's nothing to support the, you know, um, assertion that, in fact, these platforms are used more by criminals. Uh, this just, you know, isn't borne out by the evidence. When people say that line, who worries? Why worry about who has your data if you're not doing anything wrong? What is your as a privacy advocate? What's your best argument against that? Well, it's kind of a you know stupid uh, kind of a you know way to think about things, right? Because you know if you're not concerned about people looking at your stuff, uh, then you know why do you even need a password in the first place, right? Why do you need locks on your doors or curtains on your windows? Uh, I think uh, you know generally speaking, uh, everybody needs and deserves a certain level of privacy, uh, and this is something that's innate to you know um, being human, right? Uh, so you know. If people that say to me, hey, you know, I have nothing to hide, I don't really care. If you ask them, you know, give me your email password, they're going to say no. Uh, so, you know, I think when people say that, they don't actually mean it. Do you think that there's something about if, if a random person asks you, so to draw a distinction, and let's, I, this is interesting. If someone comes up to you and says, I'd like your email password, you say no, because they're not really involved in any way with you and your email service. I guess where people might differ, and this is not my view, but I'm playing devil's advocate here. Somebody could say, well, if whoever Gmail or whoever it is, is sort of the provider of that service, then it's sort of a different relationship. It's not a random person asking for your password. It's the, the people who are sort of running the service. I mean, it's it feels even silly to be saying it because because it's not a good reason for them to have access to your email. But there is a different relationship between a random person on the street asking for your house keys or your password and uh, a Gmail having some way of, of accessing your email, even though I wouldn't defend it. But it's not the same relationship. Yeah, it's not exactly the same, uh, but you know the risks kind of are the same, and I, I would actually argue that the risk you know is actually magnified, right? Mm -hmm. um, a good example of this is actually Facebook, uh, with the whole scandal with Cambridge Analytica, right? Um, you know, Facebook has an immense amount of data uh, about every citizen in the world. Uh, Google does as well, but I would say to an even larger extent, uh, and you know. Uh, this information can be used, for example, for you know political campaigns. It can be used for all sorts of reasons, right? It creates kind of a very, very you know um, uh, profile of each user that's available to governments or whoever wants to get access to them. So, uh, you know, the bigger argument here is that you know concentrating all personal data uh, in certain places uh, like Google or Facebook uh, in a way that you know is accessible by third parties is actually kind of dangerous for, for, for you know society as a whole. Uh, you also see this, uh, you know, just from looking, for example, at China, right? China is a company where all the tech companies, in fact, um, have to give access to the government. And the end result is you have a society where, you know, it's basically a massive surveillance state that is powered by big tech. Uh, now, you know, I would argue that the U.S. and Western Europe uh, is not, you know, in that uh, same level yet. Uh, but in fact, the technical capabilities to do that, uh, you know, exist uh, because this data is also concentrated in the same way. Uh, so in so a that's way, kind of Andy, it sort of sounds like it's not necessarily that the people who run the email service reading your email is the, the worst possible problem. It's that it's sort of a characteristic of a type of society that is more authoritarian, for, for example. So when we talk about like Trump's attacks on the media, it's not that he's personally going to start jailing journalists, although maybe he would want to. I don't know. But it's that the attacks on media by government are emblematic or a characteristic of authoritarian type governments that do a lot worse things as well. 
that's yeah, that's not exactly how I put it. The way I put it is essentially, you know, when you have, uh, you know, when you don't use encryption, when you have big tech collecting data uh, for the purposes of serving you ads, uh, you basically have put together the infrastructure that would enable a society like you know China uh, to arise, uh, you know, here in the West, right? And there's a certain danger to having that infrastructure, you know, out there uh, because. If it's not abused today, there's no saying that it won't be abused in the future. Uh, and that's exactly the risk that we face, right? Um, I think when people signed up for Facebook 10 years ago, um, they probably weren't aware that one day this might be used by political campaigns, right? That's not a risk that you realized, um, and yet it happened. Uh, so that's really the danger here is that we cannot predict you know, all the possible uh, negative side effects that could come from this. Uh, and you know, that's why it's probably better to you know, have privacy as a default online. Uh, Tur Turkish President Erdogan, I think it was a year or two ago, said something along the lines of, I'm more against the internet every day. And over the summer, Turkey actually banned proton mail. Uh, are there other countries that have done this or that you think are, or, or have knowledge are considering banning proton mail? Well, you know, I think, in any country that has a government that is, you know, um, very authoritative, um, which is, you know, um, trying to control the population, you know, the first thing they need to remove is actually a free press, right? And if you want to take away freedom of speech, best way to do it is to go after privacy. So, in fact, in all these countries, you first see privacy services getting, uh, you know, um, taken down because that's kind of the first step to limit freedom of speech, and that's how you control a society. Uh, so, proton mail in Turkey, that was, you know, one incident. Uh, another incident was Telegram in Russia, mm -hmm. and this is the pattern that you see over and over again. So, I would say any country where there's governments that, you know, um, are not democratic, uh, you'll see this pattern emerging more and more, I think, in the next couple of years. Do you tend to uh, see proton mail be of more interest to uh, libertarian minded folks, people on the political right, people on the political left? Is it sort of apolitical in terms of who proton mail appears to appeal to in the United States? I think it's very apolitical uh, because privacy is something that appeals to, I think, everybody, right? You know, this is something that crosses um, nationality, it crosses gender, it also crosses political leanings. Um, to kind of give an example, you know, uh, before, um, you know, uh, the, the election in 2016, um, in the U.S., a lot of users were Republicans who were afraid of, you know, Obama NSA surveillance, right? Uh, and then after the election, it was liberals afraid of, you know, Trump NSA surveillance. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that kind of shows that, you know, it's something that I think people, whether you're on the left or the right, it's something that is needed. Uh, so it's really kind of a universal value. How frequently do regulators of different kinds get in touch with you because they either are concerned about the, the the service that you're providing, that they don't like it? Do you ever see attempts at sort of bullying you into doing something? What are your sort of interactions with regulatory agencies? Actually, that's an interesting question because it's changed a lot in the past you know, four years, right? In the early days, uh, people didn't really understand it. Um, regulators were concerned. They thought it was you know, helping to aid the criminals. Uh, so early days, there was quite a bit of pushback. Then I would say around you know two or three years ago that really started to shift, especially about two years ago, uh, and now regulators are much more understanding. Uh, and what has really changed in the past four years is the rise of cybercrime. Right, uh, in 2014, um, it wasn't quite the same situation as, as it is today, where breaches are much more common, they're much more damaging, uh, and the economic impacts are much higher. Uh, so you know. People are not so hung up about privacy anymore. They're, they care more about security. Uh, and in fact, what ProtonMail provides, in addition to privacy, is very, very good security. Uh, so I think what has changed is the security argument is becoming more and more relevant um, as the internet gets more and more dangerous. Uh, and this has also led to more understanding from regulators uh, about the need for encryption and supporting services like ProtonMail. As I mentioned, I've been using a ProtonMail account for, for a little while now, and people there are people who want to send me information, possible story leads, who say, I don't want to use any other email service other than ProtonMail to send it to you. So it's very interesting that this is a much bigger part of the conversation now that, than it ever was, even as someone working in journalism. Uh, we've been speaking with Andy Yen. He's the co-founder of the end-to-end -end encrypted email service ProtonMail, which has been around since 2014. Andy, thank you so much for talking to us today. Yes, thank you for having me.